Admonition the 23rd. Signs can be prognostications. When we returned to the castle, we found Mike at the back of the house, poking about in the guts of a large green ore-fired boiler. Gubbed, he said, indicating the heater and ignition. Water's got in by the flue. He pointed toward the ceiling. Like everything else, it's rusted to buggery. Though it looks like there's a couple of hundred litres of heating oil left in the tanks. Might be useful. We told him about the meters and the old mill and the ruined courtyard building. He was keen to look, but keener on solving a couple of key questions. Gesturing at a lifted square manhole with telltale blue alcathin and a conglomeration of brass fittings, taps and pipework. Water is our first priority. Without a decent supply, there's no point in going any further. From the pressure down here, I suspect it's all right, but we should go and have a proper look. Up there, somewhere on the March Burn. Then there's the septics. We already know the electricity supply is connected. He pointed at three overhead lines, connected to the corner of the castle above us. If not live, so really it's just the getting and the disposing of water. The three of us crossed the back lawn skirted the bank, made our way through a tangle of rhododendron, hazel, holly and oak, leapt a deep field drain, scrambled over a rotten fence and eventually wormed our way into uh, the back paddock, noting as we went another telegraph pole and this time a tangle of grey armoured telephone cable at its foot. An investigation for me later, I thought. As we slogged up the steep incline, through rash and deep grass, we realised the fence intruded into the paddock, away from the stream, about halfway up. Like much of the Rylock stock fencing around Dunham's, this fence was many decades old, rusting and dependent on rotten or rotting stobs. Wondering whether the fence protected the water supply, we climbed over and waded into thicker rhododendron. We emerged one by one onto a twenty-foot-wide oval of gravel, and stone over which ran a foot wide watercourse. On the downstream side of the clearing was a thick stone parapet, two foot wide, into which, in the centre, a channel had been let, enabling the water to escape its artificial blockage. As one, we all looked over the edge of the dam. Well, that's a good ten foot drop, I said. More like fifteen, Charlie, Sadie replied. Hmm, probably more when it was built, I pined Mike. Oh, look, there's a black inch pipe running towards the fence we've just climbed over. This is our water supply? I was aghast. Oh, I doubt it, said Mike, chuckling at my reaction. See, we're just level with the castle's chimney pots. He pointed out across the roady tops to the roofless ruin with his pipe. If this was the water supply, there'd not be the sort of pressure we'd get at the back door. No, I think we'll find a newer supply further up. We extricated ourselves from the thick underbrush and carried on up the hill. Within fifty feet, Mike was proved correct. As we crested the steep incline, we found two sunken 1,500-litre tanks, which looked as if they'd been installed within the last few years. Our sense of relief that we had a supply was short-lived. Not because there was anything wrong with the apparatus. Indeed, it looked in fine fettle and was functioning properly. No, the problem was that, to the side and slightly above the two tanks, was a gate, and on that gate was a sign, in red and white. Two red panels top and bottom read, Private, and No Admittance. Well, fair enough. On a gate to a padlock paddock in the English suburbs, perhaps, the type of countryside where you'd find semi-sealed pathways and cul-de-sacs and double yellow lines and street lighting and litter bins with fag butts ranged around them. This was not the sort of sign that one expected at the head of a sparsely inhabited glen over 500 metres from the nearest road and surrounded by coops of commercial forestry. However, it was not these startlingly inappropriate admonitions which gave us pause. There was a central white band between the capitalised main message and printed in red sans serif capital letters were three extraordinary lines. Despite what you may have been told, this property does not belong to the castle. Mike read the words, shook his head, muttered Sassanax, and walked over to the tanks to check them more closely. OK, so this is definitely the March fence, Sadie stated somewhat rhetorically. Definitely. 
I dug out my pouch of drum, extricated a Rizzler, and began rolling my second cigarette of the day. Marked on the deeds? Yep. I licked the gummed edge of paper and rolled the thin tube of tobacco between thumb and forefinger. And this field, the one we're standing on, belongs to the castle? Yep. With a cigarette in my mouth, I extricated the brass Sippo, opened it and flicked the wheel. The flame bloomed and then guttered immediately. And what about the woodland to our left? I gestured back down the hill with my elbow as I flicked the cap shut and shook the lighter. The castles also. And the land across the burn? Oh, that's next doors. Bending over away from the very slight breeze, I tried again. It lit the fag. I inhaled too quickly. Foul fumes of half-burnt fuel flooded my mouth. I gagged and coughed. Gah! Then sputtered. Oh, sorry. And then wiped my lips on the back of my hand. My eyes were watering, nose stinging. As often I did that year, I asked myself why it was that I smoked. Sadie was watching me in an exasperated tone. Um, Garvey or Harvey Farm, I think. Hmm. You know, you really ought to give that up. Especially, I know, I know, kids, fresh starts, all that. I smiled and took a first proper drag and sighed. There was nothing quite like a smoke on a hill in the fresh air. The contrast between acrid, nicotine-laden poison and the sweetness of unadulterated, unpolluted, fragrant, ozone-filled highland air oxygen. Impatiently, Sadie interrupted my dopamine-loaded contemplations. So, on this side of the burn, only the land above this gate is not the castles. Correct. I coughed, embarrassed. The previous owners would have known this. Of course. Another drag, but this one was not quite as satisfying. This is, of course, the problem with any ad addictive pleasure, repeated. Uh, the returns diminish, particularly when one is distracted from that pleasure by the stimulus which first caused one to light up. For years, I had smoked as a matter of course during exams over wine with pints post prandially as aperitif to aperitif at my desk, in my car, mid-argument after sex with horse d'oeuvre, uh, finishing books, emerging from movies and waiting, of course, waiting for recovery, for buses, for friends, for family, for planes, for the office to open, for the office to close. Well, you get the idea. Smoking was caused to pause, to think, to provide space for an examination of situations internally and externally with whoever I was with. They say at parties, in offices, at pubs, that it is always the most interesting people who smoke, that those who stand in the garden puffing away really have the most to say in the funniest mode. I'm not so sure. By the water tanks, contemplating the gate, the sign and my wife's questions, the cigarette was an expression of my discomfort, with the idea that there was someone somewhere who was this petty, who was also unfortunately connected to the site. Recognising this, I dropped the rolling, ground it into the damp soil of my heel, my subconscious objective by lighting it accomplished. Sadie continued. So, to make this sign, to get it designed, printed, shipped here, and then to affix it to the gate, well, that says that whoever installed it was mightily, mightily pissed off with the castle owners and their guests. I stepped up to the gate. The sign was attached to the top bar with black nylon cable ties. I took out my Leatherman and began to detach it. But hold on. What about this right to roam legislation that they've been talking about, asked Sadie. Apparently it means as long as you are on foot you can go anywhere. Not in force yet. I slipped the blade through the remaining tie. Certainly not when this was installed. And from what I've read there will be an exclusion for private gardens. It doesn't look like a garden to me, just a paddock surrounded by conifers and filled with rashes. Maybe they drove quad bikes up here. I now had the sign away from the gate and was examining it. Ah, oh, OK, could be, but still. Well, it's something to raise with George, I gestured with the sign. If there's signage, then I'll bet there are letters and solicitors. And if so, then we should be notified. If not, it's all... If it's all denied, then perhaps this was just post-fire badness. I don't know. I turned it over in my hands. It was made of dye bond with the message printed on one side. A fairly robust treatment for a sign, though the corners were twisted around the drill holes. It makes me uncomfortable. Local feeling, I asked. Oh yes, well, perhaps the captain was acting on behalf of the sign maker. A certain Mr Hazlitt, or whatever his name is. 
Yes, he would be my bed, actually would have to be, as he owns the land up there. Or someone else making trouble, making those who are interested think there is more dispute than there actually is and therefore drive down the price. It's a bit tenuous, I said. But possible, said Sadie, that the first lot withdrew and that there was such a large amount of interest. I wish we could speak to them. The previous purchasers work out what they were told. Well, not likely. As your favourite detective would say, they're in the wind. Oh, yes. Dear old Bernie. Well, at least it's unlikely our cast of characters is as despicable as his superiors. A drift of pipe smoke alerted us to Mike's proximity. He leant over to look at the sign again and then said, Well, Charlie and Sadie, the water looks good, good flow, clean too. I've walked up to the settling tank and the collection tank and it's all working fine. There's a nice homemade filter at the top. It's out old copper pipe with its end nipped over and several holes drilled through it. Should think it will need checking every month or so, more during the winter. But the pipes are sheltered in the stream bed and they run through six inch ducting pipes, so freezing shouldn't be an issue. They did a good job with limited materials, whoever installed it. Oh, well, that's reassuring. What do you make of this? I nodded at the sign in my hands. Ah, oh, just hot heads, foolishness. Make sure your marches, yeah? And the burdens. Oh, I'm off to look at the manhole again, see if we can't find that septic tank. There has to be one. Magic Mike was quite right about making sure the deeds were sound. We kept the sign for a while, just in case its owner wanted it back. No one ever asked for it, nor did we ever find the septic tank.